This week's all about phylogeny, so let's jump in and first talk about what is a phylogenetic tree and how do we read it. So for centuries, biologists have been trying to make sense of the diversity of life, right? We've been trying to order and classify it and figure out how all of life is related and figure out what groups to put organisms into, right? Darwin proposed the mechanism of natural selection, which laid the groundwork for understanding how organisms are related to each other by demonstrating that organisms can change throughout time through this process of natural selection. And we've taken the idea, and now with molecular biology and all we know about DNA and how proteins work, we can take that process of natural selection and see it happening on a molecular level and use that mole molecular information to demonstrate how organisms are related to each other. So closely related organisms are going to share a lot of the same genes. They're going to share a lot of the same metabolic pathways, structural proteins, and anatomical features. Okay, So like us and bonobos and chimps, we have a lot of very similar structures, very similar metabolic pathways, very similar genes, because we are very, very closely related. And so phylogenetics is the process of trying to construct evolutionary trees for how organisms are related to each other using lots of different type of data, both um, molecular data like DNA, protein analysis, things like that, as well as anatomical data and shared derived, derived physical characteristics that we can see and measure. So before Darwin and before Linnaeus, right, Aristotle was also classifying life. Um, Linnaeus was the one, remember from last week, that described the process of uh, classifying organisms based on their shared characteristics. So he was using physical characteristics to determine relationships in this hierarch hierarchical um, classification system, right, where we get more and more specific as we move between the levels of taxonomy. So the largest grouping being domain, not all of the organisms in one domain will be within the same kingdom, right, one kingdom contains many phyla, when phyla contains many classes, and we get more and more exclusionary as we're moving from domain all the way up to species. So this is one way of organizing life, and taxonomy and phylogeny are often very closely related to each other, meaning that organisms that will be close together on a phylogenetic tree will probably also be closely related, meaning they'll be in the same genus, or we can look at them being in the same family, right? So taxonomy is attempting to describe the hierarchical organization of life, and phylogeny shows the evolutionary relationships, okay? They're oftentimes connected, but not always. We'll talk about an example of that. So when we're looking at phylogeny, what we're looking at is basically a family tree that shows the evolutionary relationships between organisms. So here we have a family tree of the felid family, the mustelid family, and the canid family. Okay, so felid being cats, mustelids being things like um, otters, badgers, skunks, things like that, and canids being things like wolves, dogs, coyotes. So all of these organisms are all part of the order carnivora. Okay, so we can all say that they're all related in that sense. But after carnivora, we start to see that we see some divergence, right? Cats and felids have their own unique characteristics, mustelids have their own unique characteristics, and canids have their own unique characteristics, right? But what these phylogenies are showing us is how are, they, how are these organisms related? We know that they're all part of carnivora, but which ones are more closely related to each other? Which ones share more evolutionary history and therefore share more characteristics, more DNA in common, um, structures of their proteins, maybe structures of their anatomy as well. So we're really trying to represent visually the evolutionary relation, relationships of organisms and kind of infer some of their evolutionary history. So taxonomy and phylogeny don't always match up. Um, more recently, we've been trying to align taxonomy and phylogeny. But for example, um, this glass lizard right here, right? This looks like a snake, yeah? It's a legless lizard, and for a long time it was categorized as a snake because, because it doesn't have limbs. But as biologists started to dive into it more, they started to look at some of its characteristics, they realized that it doesn't share a lot of the characteristics that we use to group snakes all together, right? So it doesn't have a really large jaw that can unhinge, um, it's missing a, a tail, well, it has a tail, but the 
the location of the tail is different than what we find in snakes. It doesn't have as many vertebra as snakes do, right? So it was recategorized later as a lizard, and we found out that it was actually most closely related to um, some of the larger monitor lizards. Okay. So the more we investigate the genetic history of an organism, its anatomy, its metabolic processes, the closer we can line up taxonomy and phylogeny. Okay, so this organism used to be down here with this group, but we've decided, nope, it's no longer there. It's up here with class lizards, and so both its taxonomy and its phylogeny changed. So its categorization, what um, genus and species it was, changed to reflect this new evolutionary relationship. So how do we read one of these trees? Okay. Reading a phylogenetic tree is a really important skill as a biologist because phylogenetic trees are everywhere. <laughs> You'll come across phylogenetic trees pretty much no matter what branch of biology you go to. So most trees that we'll be looking at are rooted, um, meaning that they have some sort of stem that represents the common ancestor of all of the organisms on that tree. Usually trees will move from left to right um, they won't always be scaled to time, but some might. So if some might have a, a scale bar down here that says time how many million years ago to today. But what we're looking at is as this tree progresses, we see we hit a branch point. What that branch point represents is that something happened way back when, we don't always know when, but we can infer that something occurred which caused a splitting of this one lineage into at least two groups. So this point right here represents the last most recent common ancestor that the branches shared. Okay, That the branches that extend from that point, that's the most recent common ancestor that all of those organisms share together. So this point right here represents the most recent common ancestor that all of these organisms, fish, frog, lizards, chimps, and humans, share at one point in time. And then each line represents an evolutionary lineage. So unless this is scaled to time, the branch length is arbitrary. But basically what we're saying is that this group right here that split off from the rest of them has its own unique evolutionary history in which natural selection was functioning on its own independently in this group as opposed to this lineage down here split off and went a totally different direction. So we see another branch point, right? So this point right here represents the common ancestor of only those organisms that stem from that point. Frogs, lizards, chimps, humans. This point right here, this is not the common ancestor that includes fish. We will sometimes mark characteristics on the tree. So like if you see a dash like this, that represents a characteristic that was gained or lost by one specific branch, one specific lineage of that tree. We also call the lineages that share the most recent, that are most closely related together, that share a, a branch point that's not shared by any other organisms. So chimps and humans, their common ancestor is right here. And this, this common ancestor is not shared by any of the other organisms on this tree. We call these sister taxa. So that represents that typically these sister taxa are very closely related to each other and that they are each other's most, closely, most close relatives. So you can see the scale of this tree is kind of weird because also there's definitely more apes around, right? There's other apes besides chimps and humans, but that they're not represented on this tree. Okay, and there's more <laughs> in reptiles than just lizards, right? So we will often simplify these phylogenies um, just to show major characteristics, major changes, and major branching patterns by removing lineages and only showing those that we wanted to highlight. But the branching pattern remains the same. Common ancestor of all of these organisms, the base lineage branched off, branched off common ancestor of the entire tree, and then sister taxa, again, those that share a common ancestor that no other branch on the tree shares. They're going to be most closely related to each other. One thing that's sometimes confusing is how the trees are oriented. Um, sometimes I like to draw my trees left to right, sometimes we'll draw them vertically, sometimes we'll draw them diagonally, but they're all showing the, the same relationship because it's all about the branching pattern. Who branched off first and then next and then next after that. So for example, in this vertical tree, 
we've taken the tree that we're looking at before and we just shifted it 90 degrees, right? So it's still showing us that same relationship. Chimps and humans are still sister taxa, and then they're most they're then sharing common ancestor most recently with lizards, right? And our fish are what we call our basal taxa, or sometimes it's called the outgroup, the group that shares the least amount of characteristics with the rest of the tree. And sometimes we draw them diagonally like this. Again, we just call these split points right here. Those are just a branch point representing the most recent common ancestor of that group. Okay, so ancestral lineage, split, common ancestor, one group went off the fish, another, the other lineage continued on and then split again, and then split again, and then split again. So these are showing evolutionary relationships, and it doesn't really matter how they're oriented. What matters is the branching pattern. So one thing that often, I remember when I was learning these, was would trip me up would be the order in which the taxa appear on the phylogeny does not infer their relatedness or evolving into one organism into another, right? Evolution is a branching pattern. It's a branching process. And so what matters most is where those nodes occur and which organisms are on that node. So we could spin the tree we could flip the tree around on any of these nodes and the relative relationship of these organisms would still be the same. That's what's really important right here, right? So if we spin, we flip chimps and humans and we flip this lineage down here and we rotate on this node right here, right? So we put fish down here at the bottom and then we also spun on this node. Lizards are now on the opposite side of frogs and then humans and chimps are now on the opposite side. What matters is that we're still showing the same exact relationship, even though the order of the branches are different. So we're still showing that humans and chimps are sister taxa, and that these two groups, humans and chimps, share a common ancestor most recently with lizards. And then all of these organisms, lizards, chimps, and humans, share a common ancestor back here with frogs. So it's the same relative relationship, even if we spin on the nodes. One other thing that kind of confused me and often can can be confusing as you're learning these phylogenies and how to interpret them, is the idea that the relationship is based on the splitting pattern, right? So if I were to ask you, who is more closely related to a frog, lizards or humans? Which one is more closely related to the, to the amphibian, to the frogs? The answer is they're equally related. Because humans, chimps, lizards, all of these organisms, their common ancestor with frogs is back here, right? So they are all equally related to frogs. And same thing with frogs versus lizards, which one is more closely related to fish? They're equally related to fish, okay? Because the common ancestor of fish and all everything else that stems from this branch point is back here. So it's all about the, relate, the branching pattern not the order of the taxa on the tree. Okay, I hope that helped with interpreting phylogenies. We're going to jump in in our next video into how to build a phylogeny.